Thank you so much, Aaron, for this uh, kind introduction, which was far too long. I did not expect you to read out all of that that I sent over. I, I sent it over, I uh, admit it. And I expected you to shorten down considerably. Oh, but, uh, okay. Uh, I also thank you and the organizers of the conference uh, for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you about how we could go on after 20 years of the Washington Principles. It is a particular honor and pleasure for me to be part of this important conference. It's the first part for me to be in Israel. This is why I came over last Saturday already. I'm here with my wife and we have been traveling around a bit. We love the people, we love the country. We went to Jerusalem, we went to Yad Vashem, and I do not have to underline this, of course, was for us as being Germans uh, a most uh, disturbing uh, moment and uh, at the same time uh, an extremely important moment of our time here in Israel. You may have noticed from the press that our Chancellor Angela Merkel has just visited the concentration camp of Auschwitz and she said uh, in, um, uh, after visiting the site I am deeply ashamed. It is beyond human understanding what happened there. I am deeply ashamed and uh, I fully share this uh, statement. In November 2019, we heard about it. Pretty much exactly last year, the German government invited to Berlin to discuss on 20 years Washington Conference Roadmap to the Future. Let me share with you an observation from this conference. And if some of you, and some of you did, attended the conference, please intervene if my perception, my recollection is not congruent with your recollection of two telling moments during this conference. On day one, Mark Mazarowski, historian at the Holocaust Art Restitution Project in Washington, D.C., asked Stuart Eisenstadt in the public discussion, should the Washington principles not generally be applied in a way that always improves the claimant's position? Eisenstadt replied, this would be a fundamental misunderstanding. The Washington principles look for just and fair solutions between the claimant and the other party. They do not look and do not intend to look exclusively at the claimant's position. On day two of the Berlin conference, the recommendation by the Dutch Restitution Commission in the recent Lebenstein Irma Klein case was criticized by Stuart Eisenstadt. And it was again criticized, by the way, in the conference or at the conference on 20 years of the CIBS recently in Paris. It would be a fundamental misunderstanding to include in the search for just and fair solutions a weighing of interests between the claimants and the other part as it was introduced by the Dutch Commission into its practice and again conducted in this particular case. I feel that this is a misunderstanding of the practice of the Dutch Commission. I'm very grateful that we might hear more about that by the chair of the Dutch Commission. Uh, to me, uh, these two statements of day one and day two in Berlin simply do not really fit together. We would, of course, have to ask Stuart Eisenstadt what he exactly said and uh, what he exactly intended to say. But I think it is fair to conclude from these two moments that there is at least room for discussion, if not uncertainty, maybe even inconsistency, in respect to the most fundamental conceptions on which the Washington principles are to operate. I believe we need to address this, and I would like to discuss this with you. This is my first point. My second point is, we are facing growing divergencies in the recommendation practice that implements the principles in the participating jurisdictions. I would like to demonstrate this to you by an example. This example is the case, the category of cases of so-called flight-related sales, 
flight, goods, flucht, gut. And it was very interesting to me yesterday to learn from Walter's presentation uh, a certain understanding of what Fluchtgut is. I just want to note um, that there are different understandings and definitions of what exactly Fluchtgut relates to. And I would like to base my presentation on a certain more narrow definition of Fluchtgut, which is uh, the category of cases where Jews persecuted by the Nazis managed to emigrate to safe states, Switzerland, UK, <coughs> USA, and also managed to export parts of their assets. And then, in order to pay for their living in these safe states after their emigration, they put up for auction works of art from their collections or other objects of value from their assets. The question is, what is a just and <coughs> fair solution for this category of cases? I will present to you the diverging solutions that have been submitted by the panels, by the recommendation bodies that are active in the participating jurisdictions. This is my second point. And my third point is the following. Whatever our solution for flight-related sales may be, so to speak, a general guideline to these cases, we need to address the growing divergencies amongst the decisions that implement the Washington Principles. How should we address this? My proposition is we should work on a restatement of restitution rules for Nazi confiscated art in the style of the US American Restatements of the Law by the American Law Institute, the ALI, in order to further support a just and fair implementation of the Washington Principles which must be, in my view, principally a uniform and effective implementation of the Washington Principles. A restatement of restitution rules on Nazi confiscated art does not intend to change the Washington Principles in any respect. It intends to further implement and effectuate what is taking place. And this project is exactly what we are currently trying to do in a academic in an academic research project at my university and I would like to hear your views on it. <coughs> so let me turn to the first point, which is to reflect on how just and fair solutions are to be conceptualized on a fundamental level. In order to do so, we could look once more at the wording of principle number eight, but we will not find any answers beyond the point that just and fair solutions are required. But, for example, we are not informed about what the addition of fair contributes to just solutions. <laughs> we could once more go back to the materials of the Washington Conference, but so far I could not spot any additional insights. I recently asked James Bindenagel make reference to him before, who is now, as you explained, professor from practice in Bonn. We are very happy to have him in Bonn. Uh, and I asked him, uh, what was your notion of justice? What was your understanding of <coughs> just and fair, the wording? You know, of course, that there is a debate, a discourse about justice uh, since Aristotle, since the Nicomachean Ethics, uh, the fifth book, what is your perception of justice? And he said to me, he could not identify any particular notion or philosophical concept of justice that the drafters had in mind. They were simply advised by the lawyers around them that this would be good wording. Just and fair. If we take this wording seriously, and I think it's still the best we can do, we need to take a decision what is the concept of justice we would like to take as a fundament? And we could connect it to a powerful theory of justice from the United States. And this is the seminal work, Justice as Fairness, by the philosopher John Rawls. There is no historical link of the Washington Principles and its principle number eight to this theory. It is just one proposition for a theory of justice that might be adequate for the subject. There may be others, 
there may be better theories. I would very much appreciate hearing your views on this fundamental point. And our project will also focus on this fundamental point and try to elaborate on which theories of justice might be adequate for the subject matter. But one thing is clear to me, we must take a decision, an interpretative decision, on this fundamental point. Otherwise, we will never have firm ground and we will have disagreement forever on the very starting point of finding just and fair solutions. Let me explain why I believe that John Rawls might be a good choice. In a nutshell, John Rawls envisages a production and organization of justice by establishing a fair starting point, the so-called original situation, as he puts it. The structure of such an original situation depends on where and for what you want to produce justice. Rawls developed his theory with a view to distributing wealth and opportunities within a given society. His theory is one on distributive justice um, in the terms of Aristotle. In our case, I think we agree that we operate in a context of corrective justice, of a justice that aims at undoing, or better, reacting adequately to wrongs. Nevertheless, the setting of an original situation of fairness, out of which then rules are generated that produce and bring about justice, could perfectly describe and be applied to the Washington principles. What else would be a plea for just and fair solutions without almost any further instructions than some sort of an original situation in this sense? What is it that secures the fairness in such an original situation. A first element of fairness is that the people who now think and discuss about principles and rules of justice do not know at that moment on which side and which position they will be later when these rules are applied to them in a concrete or real case. This is what John Rawls calls the veil of ignorance. Obviously, such a fair starting point guarantees, as best as possible, a balanced drafting of these rules. Another central element of fairness is what John Rawls calls a reflective equilibrium. In order to produce good rules, all initial intuitions, emotions of and on justice amongst the participating people are important and need to be discussed but at a certain point, all of these considerations will have been taken into account and will have influenced the balance in one way or another. And this is the moment in which the so-called reflective equilibrium will have been achieved. If we endorse this theory of justice for a moment and apply it to the Washington principles, we must conclude that balancing of interests to reach a reflective equilibrium is inherent to this concept of justice. This proposition is supported by the wording of principle number eight itself, as this principle reads, and I quote, just and fair solutions recognizing this may vary according to the facts and circumstances surrounding a specific case. This is perfectly reflected by a statement by Stuart Eisenstadt in his explanations on the principles at the Washington Conference in 1998, and I quote from the public conference materials. <coughs> After existing artworks have been matched with documented losses, comes the delicate process of reconciling competing equities of ownership to produce a just and fair solution. The subject of the eighth and ninth principle, end of quote. Reconciling competing equities of ownership, what else should this be than a balancing of weighing of interests or weighing of interests of both sides involved? So the position I would like to submit to discussion with you is the weighing of or balancing of interests is inherent to justice as such. It is then a question how it is balanced. It's not the question that there is a balancing essence. 
Second point, flight-related sales. What is a just and fair solution in cases of flight-related sales? <coughs> this is a table of 12 decisions on flight-related sales taken by the five restitution commissions in Europe that were established in order to implement print principles number 11 and 12 of the Washington Principles. As you can see very easily, there is no uniformity in the practice on these cases. Rather, there is divergency, disorder, some say there is anarchy. I would love to discuss with you all the cases, but we do not have the time. Uh, allow me to concentrate mainly on the German cases. It is mostly a German topic we are speaking about. It cannot be wrong to focus on what Germany is doing, but I will also try to include uh, the other uh, decisions very shortly. There was one important point yesterday in the discussion that was uh, one relating to distortions that may appear from provenance research, research because we focus on certain areas and types of cases. Please do not let ourselves be distorted by the cases we are discussing now. They are very specific cases by Jews that manage to emigrate. This is a specific category. It is uh, not at the center and at the core of what we are discussing, but it's something that is discussed in the context of the Washington Principles very intensely at the moment in Europe, and this is why I would like to discuss it here. The German Beratende Kommission was the first to deal with this issue in 2005. The case concerned Julius Freund, who had managed to transfer his art collection to Switzerland at the end of 1933. Julius and his wife Clara emigrated from Germany and arrived in the UK in 1939. After Julius' death in 1941, Clara needed money to cover her living expenses and sold the collection at the Galerie Fischer in Luzern in 1942. The works in question were acquired by the German Reich through Hans Posse to become part of the so-called Sonderauftrag Linz, Special Assignment Linz. The German Commission decided in favor of restitution, but partly it was heavily criticized for doing so. The main argument was that the scope of the early post-war restitution legislation by the Allied Forces, Military Government Law Number 59 of 1947 for the U.S. occupied zone in Germany and its corresponding laws in the British and French zones did not extend to such extraterritorial sales. The implementation of the Washington Principles in Germany indeed follows the lines of this old legislation enacted by the U.S. military government, which in principle is favorable to the claimants. The quite far-reaching presumption for a forced sale that is applied in today's recommendations by the German Berat and the Kommission, for instance, direct, directly derives from Article 3 of the U.S. military government law number 59, which means in the case of Julius Freund, if one follows this military law, there would not have been a claim for restitution under this law, not because of the presumption, but because of its extraterritorial limitations. But you are certainly aware that the Holocaust Claims Processing Office will host an international conference Terms of Art, Understanding the Mechanics of Dispossession during the Nazi period in May 2020, where the question will be whether the old legislation should guide us still today or not. Uh, and I'm very happy that uh, we will be part of this conference. In 2006 and 2013, the Austrian Kunstrückgabe Beirat decided against restitution in the case of Josh Ross, as well as in 2008 in the case of Hugo Simon. <coughs> the panel held that even though there may have been a line of causality between the claimant's prosecution, I quote from the uh, reasoning, of course in English translation, and the loss of the relevant property, the loss took place outside the sphere of Nazi power. And in 2016, 
The Austrian Commission had to decide a case relating to flight-related sales. Uh, again, this time concerning works from the collection of units for the same case, the same facts as the decision that was taken by the German uh, Commission. The Austrian Commission, based on the same facts, uh, as I said, and uh, refused um, restitution. In 2012, the Spoliation Advisory Panel in the United Kingdom had to come to a decision about flight-related sales in the case of Otto Koch, Ida Netta. Otto Koch died in 1919. Otto's widow, Ida, married Emil Netta in 1930. Emil died in 1936. Otto Koch had been a collector of watches, clocks, which Ida inherited. She managed to bring 161 watches and clocks of this collection to England when she emigrated, which were eventually sold by Christie's in London in June 1939. The panel assumed that this was a forced sale in principle, but nonetheless held that, and I quote from the reasoning, the sale is at the lower end of any scale of gravity for such sales. It is very different from those cases where valuable paintings were sold, for example in occupied Belgium to pay for food, or where all assets had to be sold in Germany in the late 1930s to pay extortionate taxes. The sale was not compelled by any need to purchase freedom or to sustain the necessities of life. In 2014, the German Commission dealt again with a case of flight-related sales, this time in the case of Clara Levy, that involved an auction in New York. And uh, in this case, the German Commission refused recommending restitution. The German Commission held no forced sale since, and I quote from the reasoning, it is not to be presumed that the Washington Declaration, even if it is interpreted in the widest possible sense, and thus extended to cover also forced sales or other forms of persecution-related confiscation, aims to reverse sales transactions such as this one, which was effectively concluded under civil law by the rightful owners in New York, and the subsequent resales of the painting. Another case from Germany relates to the case of Alfred Flechtheim, which is basically similar, and I directly go to the decisive lines in the reasoning, and I quote again, if an art dealer and collector persecuted by the Nazis sold a painting on the regular art market or at auction in a safe country <coughs> abroad, there would, have be, there would have to be very specific reasons to recognize such a sale as a loss of property as the result of Nazi persecution. In the case of Flechtheim and the painting Violon et Encrier, no such reasons are apparent. Let me use the last two minutes to say a few words on the uh, latest case from Germany, which is uh, Max Emden of 2019. Max Emden was the founder of a chain of leading department stores in Germany in the 1920s, among them the Kaufhaus des Westens in Berlin, Oberpollinger in Munich, and 30 department stores with roughly 10,000 employees. Emden sold all of, his, all of these assets to Karstadt in 1926, emigrated from Germany to Switzerland in 1927, and bought two islands, the Brissago Islands and the Lago Maggiore. He ultimately became a Swiss citizen before the Nazis came to power, but large parts of his assets remained in Germany and were later taken by the Nazis. Facing increasing economic difficulties in Switzerland after 1937, <coughs> he sold several paintings by Canaletto in Switzerland. The German Commission decided to recommend restitution since Max Emden's economic plight was directly caused by national socialist persecution. My time is over, I am realizing that, so I just wrap it up by saying this is a kind of um, picture that we need to discuss. There are differences in the approaches, differences in the uh, definitions, differences in the rules that appear from practice. 
and our project is the attempt to distill from this practice black letter rules that would represent the practice to make them available for further discussion. That's the project of the restatements uh, of the law in the United States in general, and this would be the object, the aim, the objective of our project at the University. Well, thank you very much. For